This is a gala apple tree. It's a store-bought grafted apple. And each fall, all members of the, uh, what is it? The deer family, what are they, cervids? I think it's cervids, but anyway. All members of the cervid family, the deer family, like to rut. Um, even the ones that keep their antlers. I think that's the, I think it's, well, I'm not really sure. I think it's, do caribou keep their antlers? I don't know. Um, hmm. I'm getting confused. I think caribou just, well, let me just, I'm not going to erase this video to say that. I know that caribou, both males and females, get antlers, but I don't think they keep them. I think they shed them as well. Anyway, so right when they start to develop new antlers, the deer like to rub the velvet, the skin off of the antlers because it itches really bad and there's nerves in there because because antlers are very rapidly growing parts of the deer and so they itch and they grow kind of like a child cutting teeth and um if you ever chewed on tin on aluminum foil while you're eating like a chocolate milk dud or whatever they are um if you're eating a, a chocolate a drop Hershey's Kiss or something like that and you've accidentally got some of the foil and you've eaten and you've bit into it where you have a feeling you'll know what the deer feel like when their nerves touch the metal when they're rubbing their antlers it's very shockingly painful to them and it's a sensation that they don't want to come back and do again the a male deer was actively rubbing on this beautiful tree a month ago because they only rub in the fall when the antlers are coming back they don't do it any other time of the year they stop in winter but during this time they rubbed and i saw it but i was too late i had so many things in my mind as it was the worst farming year i've ever had the only thing i think i did well with was the eggplants and the peppers and you know a few things but um this you can see where there was some some problems anyway the reason that you're seeing all this metal on this tree is I'll explain that first off all I needed was this this is how you stop a deer from rubbing small talk aside whatever you take a piece of wire barbed wire is really good because it, they quickly get their horn their antler um, caught in that and they don't like it um, they don't like to get tangled in anything which uh, right away when I saw this I said oh no the deer are already rubbing. I've got to get out here and do something. So quickly I grabbed some branches and dragged them to this tree. And I, I ran to the house and I got a piece of, a uh, small piece of wire and I twisted around this area right here loosely and then I wrapped it around to the bottom. And that was fine. The deer never came back to rub again because they don't like to touch metal and they don't like to get tangled. So there you go. That's all there is to it. Wrap a twist and you won't have any trouble. Well, I'm going to tell you more. The reason it has the aluminum foil, which is heavy-duty aluminum foil, is because I'd already bought the aluminum foil. And I didn't have enough of this wire to cut up anymore to put all my trees. I had to do all my new saplings. Because so I've got a bunch of apples and another bunch of pecans. And I, um, I have to wrap, like, 40 trees. And so I had this foil already. And I bought the foil because about... 15 years ago, I thought, oh, I'm going to stop the voles, which is a, um, it's a, a large short-tailed field rat that, that eats, um, bark during the winter time. It doesn't hibernate. It gets active during the winter and, um, eats bark, loves bark in the winter, and it can girdle your trees, eating the bark off them in the roots, and it loves fig trees. So when you protect the fig trees and cover them up with leaves and, um, pie needles or whatever you want to do they love that they the voles go inside and, and make a little nest and get warm and decide well let's snack on this bark so i thought well i'm going to wrap them with alum with aluminum foil heavy duty before i cover the trees i never did that though i've never used the foil so i want to get rid of it so i have found that aluminum foil heavy duty works just as well as wrapping a piece of wire around so if you don't have this excess wire which I have a lot of excess wire because I bought two rolls of barbed wire I'm covering 23 acres I've already had a five strand barbed wire fence with it all the way around the perimeter 
and I still have extra wire because it comes in quarter mile rolls and at the time I bought it 23 years ago it was only $16 for a roll so I bought two rolls um, it was made in the USA and things were very cheap but now the people said hey we can make it cheaper in Mexico so they started buying it from Mexico the wire became more expensive because of the gas prices and then the company that made the wire here went out of business and so you have to buy it from Mexico and now it's thinner and it's very very expensive but anyway so I have excess wire but I don't want to cut it in pieces so I only put this wire and this stuff on the trees during the winter and once rutting is over I take it off and it's just temporary and it's so simple but I needed to use the aluminum foil so I did and it worked because I've tested it out this was an actively rubbed tree and now it's completely stopped. They are not touching it anymore. And this one here, they were getting ready to rub this. Quickly I grabbed everything I could get in the area. And um, my deer are very tame. And they don't, uh, I can't scare them away. So they just pretty much do all kinds of stuff to the tree if I don't do this. Um, I tried putting a lot of things around. They're not afraid of urine, human urine. They are kind of afraid of house cat uh, poop. A friend of mine, um, she has a litter box and she gave me some house cat poop 23 years ago, 23 years ago, and it seemed to work before I discovered this method. So what you got here, she got just an old tree branch, dead tree branch that I duct taped to this. That doesn't work, but that's just to keep the horses from messing with it. And um, I got these branches hanging around just to stop the horses from dancing on it because they like to dance on stuff. But this right here is for the deer. They touch that and they run off. Oh, I don't want to scrape on that. That hurts the nerves in my antlers. So that stopped. They don't, they're not messing with that one. That's another store-bought apple tree. And that's a yellow delicious apple, one of my favorites. And it pollinates all the other apples. And this here is another gala that I store bought. And you can see this work because right now I'm at prime rutting season. It's November. The deer are actively rubbing the velvet and they are finished with this tree. They don't want to touch any of these trees anymore. I'll show you a bunch of stuff. But look at that. You want to stop it? Just get you some heavy dude aluminum foil. Wrap it. You don't have to go all the way to the bottom. Just get it. Just put it on there with your hands and squeeze it. Isn't that simple? And I know it works because I've been doing this for two decades. 23 years. And I've not failed. And around February, I'm going to take all this off the trees. And um, if I have any barbed wire around it, I'm going to save that for next year. And I'm going to put it back on this time uh, around the middle of October instead of waiting too long because I already got, let them get started over there on that one tree. Once again, I got to tell you how awesome turnips are. I just, there's no pests during the winter here, and the winters aren't that cold in Zone 7 for turnips. So, I can throw turnips out here, and they will grow all winter long right in the pastures. And I don't have to do anything to the soil, just throw it out there. Just like, you know, you wouldn't believe. It's, it's so great. But then when summer comes, of course, they will rot away, and they won't be growable. Have to do it in the winter. But that's some food that's so free, because I even resave the seeds. Once they bloom, the honeybees love them. I don't have to do anything to them at all. I take the seed, the dry seed pods in the house. I put them in a five gallon bucket and kind of smash them a little bit with a fist. And then take them outside, let the chaff blow away um, by throwing them up and down kind of on a sheet. And then I save the seeds and I get a big old bucket of seeds and then I take them outside, scatter them when winter comes. And there they are. And what you see here, this is how I stop horses from getting my trees. This is a row of saplings. Horses love to dance on trees and uh, scratch on them and stuff. So I put some posts up and a strand of barbed wire all the way down and they don't mess with them. It also helps with the deer. Deer don't want to rut on those trees because it's next to this wire. So they'll touch that wire with their antlers and they'll get out of there. So I don't have to worry about protecting these trees. See, I've got a lot of experience with this. The main reason is because I, I have pet deer that I, I keep and I, I don't hurt them and I let them live here and I learn how to get around 
having animals while I farm. And you just learn to live with them. I mean, think about this. We've been farming for thousands of years with animals. Firearms have only been invented that really work and are, you know, able to reload and shoot multiple times only in the last hundred years. So what did our ancestors do to farm? When there were far more predators, far more disasters, even warriors coming in and stealing your crops and things, and they were still successful and able to develop um, elaborate, beautiful vegetable types and fruit types. Well, they had dogs to protect their things. They used dogs because there were no guns. And they used tact. They used tact. They, they knew what to do. They, and that's one thing you can do is just wrap wire on your trees. And that, that stops that. This here's a muscadine and, oh, the sun's in your eyes. This is a muscadine and pruning it down low keeps it productive and I can reach the crops. I don't have to spray muscadines or anything here where I live. The only thing is I'm on zone seven and some years they freeze down and have to start all over again. It takes three years to get them back into production. But this area here has a microclimate. It didn't get so cold um, because I'm next to a wonderful beaver pond. And this is a beaver pond. They built this. Um, it goes quite a ways. And yes, here's how you stop beavers from hurting your trees. The, the best way, well, not your trees, you stop beavers from chewing your vines. Because see, they'll come up off the creek and they'll want to chew my vines. Well, it's very simple. I did this 20 years ago when they chewed it one time. This is a piece of wire from a fence. See? And I just laid it here like this. And twist it with my hand just like that. It's very simple, very simple. And the beaver came up to take a taste. Got his teeth caught in that metal and said, Uh-oh, <laughs> I don't want to mess with that. And he never again, or she, never again decided to take that home to their family for food. And I do it, I did it to all my muscadines that are next to this creek. And this muscadine is, this vineyard is the only vineyard that I have that has never had any trouble at all with any freeze back because of that creek that the beavers made. That creek right there produces enough um, moderation in temperature. So when we get our sudden drops down to zero Fahrenheit or close to it in the single digits, Somehow, it stays warm enough right around here to keep the muscadines from freezing, from getting so cold. The muscadines are hardy down to about, I'm going to say, down to about 8 degrees. But any prolonged 8 degree Fahrenheit temperature, and that's it for them. But they do, they do come back from the roots, no matter what. But just as a pomegranate, if they freeze down to the roots and try to come back, they're not going to bear fruit. Because I've been trying to grow pomegranates, they freeze back... Um, when it gets down to the single digit numbers, temperatures, and they never bear fruit. But, oh, this is what I wanted to show you before I went down there to show you more of the, the wrapped trees. I let this muscadine grow fruit from me, and then I let some go up here into this walnut, and it produces enough fruit in that walnut tree for the animals, too. So I got plenty of fruit, plus I let the animals have whatever's up there. They're awesome climbers, so that works for them. And it's beautiful, beautiful um, grove of bamboo. I love it. These are goji berries, and they're so hardy that even though they're freezing and everything, they're still green. And this is a type that's used for the herbal. They use it as a pot herb in Asia. They don't eat the fruit of this one because it doesn't bear any fruit much, but it's extremely vigorous. The one that bears fruit really well is not very vigorous. They don't eat that one for a potter because it doesn't produce enough good green um, food. It, it doesn't do it fast. It, this one here is so vigorous it can be very uh, vivacious. It gets out there and just does it all. 
Now here's something cool. A mulberry tree, certain varieties will really root well and certain varieties will not. Now I pruned my mulberry back and this is called the dwarf everberry mulberry. So I pruned back the upper limbs so I can reach it again. Stuck them in the ground and they started rooting just great. But as you see, the horses have danced them down and killed them. So they didn't get to grow. But they would have grown just by sticking the branches in the ground. That's how well they grow. But meanwhile, my big, huge uh, dwarf, I mean my big, huge Illinois ever-bearing mulberries don't root well. I cannot get them to root. I'm pretty sure if I air-layered them, it'd be no trouble, but they won't root just by sticking their limbs in the ground. I think I can pretty much air-layer anything. Anyone can. And the trick to air-layering is severing the outer bark so that the tree can only produce food. The roots can produce food to the upper part of the branch, but they, since the ring of bark has been cut, the branch can't put food back down. So it uses all the food the roots send it and photosynthesizes it and then says, oh man, I'm going to send some of this stuff back down to the roots. Well, there aren't any roots. It can't get to the roots because of that ring of bark. And so it starts sending its own roots out of there. So that's the trick to air layering. Plus it stimulates it by keeping it dark. But I'm just talking because I know this is for gardening and um, I'm really trying to teach you guys everything that I know because I don't know why. I just want to. I love that. This bamboo, just love it. Oh, and this is what I've used it for. This place used to really flood. Well, they used to kill my beavers. That caused a lot of trouble. The beavers' dams stop flooding because they help control and moderate the erosion. They stop it from happening. This is one of my artificial beaver dams I made myself by using the bamboo cuttings. And as you can see, I made my own little walls. My girlfriend helped me. They're little walls of dams. So when the creek rises and starts washing through here and trying to carry away soil because of all the construction going on and stuff up above, it hits these little dams and it can't go, it can't wash, it has to catch. And it catches stuff as you can see. And see so the bamboo has stopped erosion. And you can see that and it's just beautiful in here. So many birds come here to spend the night at night. It sounds so nice. They land, the migratory birds, you can just watch them right before evening. Flying in, in the spring and in the fall, just dropping from the sky and falling into this green oasis where they, they hide and sleep for the night, comfortable. I'd like to learn the things that a lot of people, a lot of you all know, you guys know, you people, about wood crafting because you could do so much with this bamboo and it's so free, there's so much of it. I use it with like my caveman, uh, my caveman education, whatever you would call it. I stick it in fence lines and keep the goats from getting out. Just simple things with it. Plant stakes, but the trick to bamboo that I've learned is splitting it. It splits really easy. You don't want to use it just like it is. You want to take a knife, any old cheap knife, and hammer it a little. And it'll split right down the middle perfectly every time. And you can just make that stuff into smaller and smaller pieces that are really long and they bend and they don't break. And you can make anything with them. You can weave them together. So, anyway, I was just trying to show you a few things about how to stop deer from rutting on your trees and killing them. It's very simple. Now here is autumn olive, also known as Russian olive. The animals love the fruit. And I just want you to know I've had this here for 23 years. And on my land, they have never made any babies. They have never been reproductive. They don't even send up suckers. These don't. I have three very healthy ones. And, um, well, maybe there are a few babies, but it's been 23 years and I haven't really seen very many. 
maybe one or two. But you can see underneath there, lots of other kinds of plants are there. You've got Robesnia, frostweed, which is called frostweed because when it, fro when it freezes in the morning, whirls of Jack Frost form at the root base every morning. And then we've got a baby plum tree, wild plum. And then we've got Indian currant, which is not tasty, has no flavor whatsoever. I don't know why they call it Indian currant, because I don't know if anyone ever ate it. The goats eat it once in a while. But this right here was full of fruit. The migratory birds came in and said, oh good, a restaurant. And they ate all the fruit in one night. And went to bed and they ran over. I was gonna show you this. Okay, so I didn't want this tree to be hurt by the deer. So I simply taped a limb to it and put the aluminum foil on there a few weeks ago and nothing has rutted it. I didn't have to do anything to this one. This is a crab apple. I didn't do anything to it. But all these trees had problems when they were young and I just protected them. This one one reason they're not bothering it is it has, I let some briars grow on it. They don't like being tangled. Here's how I protected the figs. I had some old hay, so I just covered them up in that. And out here in the open, hopefully, the owls at night and the hawks will um, keep the voles from coming in there and destroying my figs. So this is a pretty open area right here, and it's patrolled pretty well by the hawks and the owls. So I have some pretty tame hawks they are basically trained to leave my chickens alone. I raised them because they were the mother anyway. I raised her. She's now dead. Oh, goody. Everything looks really nice today. Nice and calm. Oh, there's some duckies. Oh, cool. Anyway, so there's that. And what am I doing? I don't need you to walk around. This is boring. Here's another tree that I put foil on to stop it from getting rutted, and it works. Here's another tree that I put foil on, and it works. And that's how I do it. It's just heavy-duty foil. Don't get the regular foil. It just peels and blows away in the wind and it won't work. This has to be heavy duty foil. It has to be heavy duty. And you only need one pack, one roll of it. And it's like three or four dollars at the store. And it'll do every tree you probably have if you've got like 50 trees, because you only need to wrap it a little bit one time around. You just squeeze it with your hands. But I've got all my trees wrapped that way. Except for trees that are already grown up. Oh yeah, another thing. Deer only want to rub on small baby trees. They don't rub on big trees. And it doesn't matter what size the deer is. Um, the bigger deer will also rub on the small trees, the bigger males. And the young males will also rub on the small trees. And they'll also rub on a large tree if it's all they can get. And because I have protected all the smaller trees, they went to rubbing on this basswood tree, which is very, this is a 10 year old basswood. And see, that's what they rubbed on right there. So I stopped them in their tracks. Cause I didn't think they'd rub on that. And I put this piece of barbed wire and this is how I do it. I just take a piece of barbed wire I'm not using like this and wrap it on the tree. And see, you can tell the deer hasn't rubbed anymore. This old branch here, which is brittle, would have this weed branch would have already been snapped to pieces. But once they touch that metal, they're out of there. So this was a long video. I'm sorry, but I have to prove my point that this works. I know this works because I've been doing it over 20 years, 23 years with my trees, and I have full-grown 
pecan trees, as you can see, all over the place, which only are here because I've learned how to protect them. And that's how you do it. You simply wrap a wire around them. Isn't that simple? It's no more, no more problems. And if deer are getting into your garden, I've learned the best way to do that. Put a electric fence around it with only one strand of wire. Uh-oh, looky here. That little bit of aluminum foil I put on this one. That wasn't a deer that did that because you can see that this hasn't been rutted at all. It still has a piece of paper. This was one of my horses that was curious and decided to take a little nip off of the foil. But I'm still gonna put the foil back because the deer aren't, aren't through rutting yet. So that's, that's how that is. The horses are kind of a problem. And the reason they did that is because they like to come here and itch their, that's why it's so loose. This fence post shouldn't be this loose. Deer have been, I mean, <laughs> horses have been scratching their chins and their faces on it. They love that back scratcher effect that they get from that. And another thing you can do to protect your, your trees from your horses is go ahead and plant your blackberries with thorns on them beside your trees. And I highly recommended through a lot of experience. I used to have a 300 foot row of blackberries here. Make sure you get, if you're in an area that's prone to blossom in rosette or whatever it's called on, um, well, you'll know what it is. It's some kind of a, a rosette, rusty um, disease that blackberries get. Make sure you get a very resistant variety because my entire 300 foot row of Chickasaws that I purchased and spent a lot of money, like $3 a piece, planted them a couple feet apart, we're looking at $300 right there, um, at least. It only lasted me about five or six years and it died. Never was productive, they were beautiful large berries, but they got that disease and died out and I had to just mow them down and forget about them. But plant the right kind of blackberries and also go ahead and get the thorny kind. Don't go with the thornless. Because the thornless are not gonna keep protected. The thorns are there for a reason. Mother Nature knew what she's doing. Get the thorny blackberries. They'll keep the animals from eating the berries as much. They'll also keep horses from rubbing on them and they'll keep them from eating the leaves too. So the thorny varieties, people say taste better anyway. So that's one thing I got to tell you. And I still say my very favorite blackberry is the old fashioned Himalayan blackberry. It's right here. It survived the diseases. It's still here, still got its leaves. It has a very tasty large berry, tastes like a boysenberry, a variety that's kind of like a mixture between a raspberry and a blackberry. It's very flavorful, very productive. What it didn't like this year was a major flood came and swept over it and buried it into debris, but it gave it a rest. I'm sure I'm gonna get a really good crop this year. It'll come back vigorous. But I like the Himalayan. It's probably my very favorite. And let's see what else we got. I don't know what variety of tree that big old pecan right there is, but it has great big nuts. And I got one nut off of it this year. And the reason is that the late freeze killed all the nuts and all my pears and all my apples and caused a lot of trouble. The two late freezes. So I didn't have any fruit. And it's also the first year that my BB tree didn't even, my BB trees didn't even bloom. It's also the first year that I didn't get any muscadines on my vines. But I don't want to keep going on about that. But here's my favorite type of um, tomato if you want to live without any troubles. This tomato here is called the Matt's Wild Cherry Tomato. And I grow it wherever I have had to burn brush. And right here is where I used to have a grove of black walnuts. And these Matt's Wild Cherries, you can see how productive they are. It's late freezing, all the freezing's done, and you can still see all the remnants of all the fruit. And here's a black walnut stump right here. 
And I've got black walnut stumps all over the place here because they were all clustered together and I wanted to grow a pecan. So I planted a pecan here and cut these down and put the, the tomatoes here. So they're lying about juglone. Juglone does not stop tomatoes or nightshade family plants from growing. They thrive in it. It's a total lie. This is proof. See, here's another black walnut stump. I took my battery powered drill and I drilled holes in here to help it hurry up and rot. See the little holes? I want the insects and the funguses to get inside and the dirt to get in there and help it rot. And that's how you do that. And you have to cut your stumps at ground level. It also helps and that way you can mow over them. Um, but I just wanted to tell you that the black walnuts do not hinder the growth of any tomato plants. Look at the big old stumps and these were big old black walnuts. Um, see all these tomato vines here? These are the remnants of tomato vines. And they're all over the top of my black walnuts. And there was, the, I had the brush piled up here for many, many months before it got dry enough to burn the brush and I finally burned the brush. And so all the ashes from there and all the juglone has leached into the ground. And of course, you know, the juglone rich roots are rotting into the soil. Didn't hurt these tomatoes one bit. So the whole juglone thing, I promise you, is a freaking complete myth. I mean, just look. Tomatoes are healthy enough to fruit like that during a drought. They're healthy enough to do anything. I mean, this and this is in a black walnut prone forest. There you go. Plus, if you look right there, you'll see a gigantic black walnut. It doesn't look as big on camera as it really is. It's huge. That's a hundred feet tall, maybe. It's bigger around than you can believe, and its roots are out here. So that's a black walnut. And that's a baby black walnut right there, which I've just killed, and that's a pecan, no problem. And um, I've got black walnuts. That's a pecan. That's a pecan. But yeah, there's a lot of here. Stumps. Matter of fact, there's another stump because this was a grove of black walnuts. And right after I got done, as soon as I got them burned, I planted the Matt's Wild Cherries. They thrived on their own as they do and produced. We used to come out here this summer and all the way into this fall and we filled up eating those wonderful tasty things. And I want to say that the Matt's Wild Cherry tastes better than any of the ones I've ever eaten. They're just so tiny. They're small as a marble. And I'm not talking about the shooter marble. They're, they're as small as a marble is. A regular tiny marble. And they taste like a giant tomato. See, that's a marble sized. And that's not a ripe one. That's one that got killed by the frost before it was too late. I'm calling it a frost, but it's already been in the 20s, so it's a freeze, not a frost. There is my sad vineyard. I'm not even going to bother pruning it this winter. I'm going to wait until spring to see what parts are dead and what parts are alive. You can kind of tell that it's alive, but there's a lot of dead branches, and I can't really discern that when it's winter time. Here's another apple tree that I protected. As you can see, nothing but aluminum foil. And I went ahead and put a little strip of duct tape on there just to scare them a little. There's another one with foil on it. And here's a beautiful pear tree that's a young one that's only a few years old that survived everything because I protected that. More of the fruit trees. In case you wanted an update on the Moso. Zone 7 Moso. Don't you believe anybody that tells you can grow it colder than that. Because look at those stalks. Died down. And all year, all summer, that's all I got out of it. These little baby green shoots that survived. And if we're really lucky, they may, the Moso Bamboo may be able to shoot up again this spring and survive. But I may just end up bush hogging over the whole mess and uh, opening up this fence and turning it into a place to put a pecan tree or something because this, this is a 15 year old bamboo forest that never amounted to anything. It did get up that good, but that's it. It's going to have to start all over from these babies again. It's not very good for zone 7. Now, <clears throat> zone 9, zone 10, you would have yourself some nice bamboo. 
but not zone seven. Oh, those maple trees. They are almost ready to tap. I sure do like the color of them. I like the black bark, and I love the color of the leaves. And I really like the sap, the watery sap, once I boil it down into sugary sap. This big old tree here is an Illinois everbearing mulberry tree. It's a pretty tree with nice big leaves, smooth bark, and it's very disease resistant. It doesn't get the diseases that my red mulberries get because I think it's crossed up between the white and the red. But as far as fruit production goes, it doesn't bear very much fruit. It only bears it in the springtime. I don't know why they gave it the name Everbearing, because it is not an Everbearer. They shouldn't even be using that name. They should just say Spring Bearing Mulberry with pretty leaves, vigorous growth, and extremely good shade. There's nothing better for shade than this mulberry, and it grew so fast. I'd say this mulberry is, oh, I know already, it's 12 years old, so that's pretty old. But. It isn't a very good producer. I've never ever in 12 years been able to use the fruit for anything or eat enough to get full, even though it's huge. And I've got a lot of these trees because there's not enough. It's so high up and by the time it drops to the ground, it's kind of nasty. And so I got to look real careful at each one that falls. And it doesn't compare to my little dwarf ever bearing mulberry because I can make as many of the dwarf everbearings as I want just by putting them in a glass of water at certain times of the year. They're green growth, they're green limbs, and just replanting them. And I can reach the fruit, and it's small, but it's very much more productive. And I think it tastes a lot better than this. I'm not really, I don't really like the taste of the Illinois everbearing either. But the fruit is large. Not real large, but it's larger. I'd love to have some of those tropical varieties. There's some really good ones, but they won't live where I live. So I didn't even bother trying, because I can read the reviews. One of the places to read is Dave's Garden. If you have a question about any kind of a fruit tree or something, look up Dave's Garden. It's a good site. This is known as a rice paper plant, the big old green wilted up looking plant. But if anybody knows what you can do with it, let me know because there's nothing online about it. And a friend of mine who owned a big nursery gave it to me. Her name was Debbie. And uh, she had every kind of exotic plant you could name because she had a bunch of big polytunnels. And they were heated. She said, you can have that plant if you really want it. I took it home, planted it, and it thrived. But what do you do with it? Get any excuses? I don't know. I know the goats like to eat the leaves, so that means the deer like to eat the leaves. Anything a goat will eat, a deer loves. So, that's something I don't know anything about. Right here is where I got snake bit by that cotton mouth. So she may be out sunning today because on warm days, they and the turtles like to lay around beside this. And here is one thing that I love. That's a little baby Chinese windmill palm. And here in zone 7, these will get 15 feet tall. And they are a magnificent looking palm tree. Prettier than any palm tree I know of. Fan leaves and they have a really woolly trunk. It's a thin, long, narrow, woolly trunk. Look them up. Tacky, Karma, something like that. Anyway, they are an awesome tree to grow. If you're in zone 7, you can grow a palm tree with no protection. That's the one. And it even took the coldest we've ever had, which was last year. We got way below zero, and it survived. So I've got three of them. And here's another one. Chinese windmill palm. 
get one if you like palm trees and you live in a cold climate like zone 7 you will love it they will grow without protection and those babies there have been through hell droughts floods cold spells late freezes extreme heat extreme cold 12 below zero and they're still beautiful and they're growing and they grow exponentially so now I'm noticing there's they're growing much faster they're getting a trunk so next year I'm gonna go ahead and say they'll be waist tall in 2022 right now it's November 2021 this right here is a species of bamboo that only gets a foot tall it's real pretty but it's only good for horse feed. You can't really do anything else with it, but let the horses eat it. And they're right over there, walking around, grazing. This is the basswood tree, all split up. Basswoods love to make their own little suckers. They can make a grove right next to them. They just keep on coming on out. And um, this is another Illinois Everbearing. And those are Percheron horses. Percherons come in black and they come in gray. And when the grays get older, they turn white like that. And when they're first born, almost all Percherons are born black. As a matter of fact, when she was first born, this grayish white one, she was called Black Baby because she was a baby horse and she was black. And within about a year, she started to become bluish colored. And when she was five and six and seven years old, she was very, very blue, and her name became Blue. Blue. And then we decided to name her Guinevere, and we decided to name her partner, that female there that's a half-sister. We decided to name that girl Elaine, off of the um, some kind of a fairy tale or something. I can't remember all of it, but those are the horses, and let's see over here, the strangest thing happened for no reason, I don't understand it, my creek water turned black, isn't that strange, now this is the weirdest thing, I have an oil company, a gas company, and you can't sue them because they keep changing companies, changing names, kind of like Monsanto does. They have buildings full of lawyers that work only for them. But the water suddenly turned black. It's probably because they fracked down below and a bunch of shale has erupted and got into the water supply. I wouldn't doubt that. Oh, look at the birds. Anyway. Isn't that weird? This water is generally clear as it can be. Now it's as black as coffee. Maybe, maybe it's from the foliage falling in the fall making a tea. That's possible. Could be from that because in Florida we had black water when I lived there. And um, that was from the foliage, they said. The tannins created black water. And yeah, all the, all the leaves are now falling, and we haven't had very much rain. and Maybe just enough rain for the tannins to make it black. Now these two pears were the only ones that made any fruit this year that, uh, to mention. And that's because they're next to this water well here. Beavers made this. A long time ago, beavers made this. And then they exterminated the beavers and it was almost destroyed and started to wash out. And then they, I bought the land and then the beavers came back slowly. First there was a male for a long time that used to swim with my girlfriend. And then eventually, a few years later, a few floods later, it found a mate. And now it's been a little more active and doing more work. And it's really been beneficial. And it must have a family now because I'll even show you. They're um, eating the privet plants. Privets are an evergreen almost. It's a deciduous leafy shrub they use for privacy hedges. They're edible from all species eat them. 
They're in the Augustrum family. They're super good for honeybees when they bloom. And you can see right here that right down there, there are a bunch of green boffs in the water right behind that tall briar there. You can see them laying there. That's their little refrigerator storage they've been eating from. And up the bank, they go and pick them. So they actually keep the woods diverse and kind of garden a little bit. But the best thing that a beaver does is it clears the brush in.